Well, some of you may know, but I was born in Louisville, Kentucky. But when I was five years old, my parents moved us to Akron, Ohio, just before I went to first grade. So while I grew up, I was born in Louisville, I don't have any real memories from there. My memories really start at 2204 23rd Street in Akron, Ohio. Uh, this is a picture of my brother Joe and me standing on the porch of that row house in Akron, Ohio in about 1962. Pretty sharp in those red blazers. If you can, my, my face is kind of pixelated there. I'm the tall one, but I don't look real happy. We had bow ties on there, too. It was very, very sharp. Thanks, Mom, for that look. Uh, I remember my first school, which was Lawndale Elementary School, where I went to first and second grade. It was a, an ancient three-story brick building with those uh, wooden desks bolted to the floor in every classroom. How many went to a classroom like that where it had bolted? Yeah, it maybe explain to the younger generation what that was like. Uh, I remember our little church, Lawndale Church of the Christian and Missionary Alliance. Uh, this wasn't actually our church. It reminds me a lot of the church I grew up in because they tore our little church down in the early 1970s. That church was where I would walk every Sunday morning with my dad when it was walkable. I was just a few blocks away, and I would get there early just so I could have the chance to help an old man named Mr. Drake ring the church bell. There was a rope hanging down out of the steeple. I could actually pull on it. My feet would come off the floor. He'd hang on to me, and I could ring that church bell. It was, my, it, was, it was my introduction to church leadership, I suppose. And that church is where I heard a visiting preacher say one Sunday evening when I was eight years old, you're not a Christian here just because your parents are. That made sense to me. And the next day at age eight, I opened my heart to Christ in faith and began my journey with him. Akron was where I played in my very first little league team. When I was eight years old, I once pitched in a game. I have barely memories of this. I actually walked um, ten guys in one inning one time. Fortunately, there were no video cameras back in those days. My favorite teams were the Browns and the Indians because I grew up in Akron. But one day when I was nine years old, uh, my parents announced to us that we would no longer be living in Akron. We were going to move, moving to a far away and kind of scary place called New York. How many here moved as children? Remember moving schools and look at that, yeah. Any families here move in the last year and you're new to this area? Anybody? Well, you know what that feels like then. I can still remember the unsettling, wrenching feeling of losing the place I knew as home. That room in our home where I live, where my bed was, where my brother and I slept, our school, our church, my friends. I remember that weird, unsettling feeling, going to a place I'd never even seen before, barely even heard of before. And that brings us to our story today. Our year-long theme is the story of God. We've uh, spent 10 weeks or so in the book of Genesis, looking through the first 10 chapters. We've seen that Genesis is the beginning of everything. It's the beginning of all creation. It's the beginning of human civilization. It's the beginning of sin and the curse and evil in the world. It's also the beginning of God's covenant promise to bring a way of salvation. And today we begin what is our Advent series, but we're beginning in a weird place. In Genesis chapter 12, we begin a series called The Promise. We're looking at the call of Abram today, a man later known as Abraham. So watch the screens or open your Bibles, Genesis chapter 12. Follow along as I read the beginning of this great story. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old and when he departed from Haran, and Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and all the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Moreh. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. Now this is an old, ancient, and kind of strange story to begin our Advent series with. But it's an important one. And I want to try to unfold that for you today. We're going to begin with what I'm calling the call. The first thing we see in this ancient text is the call of God. Back when we were kids, my brother and I learned very early on to recognize our dad's whistle. Uh, my dad uh, has this amazing ability to whistle. He doesn't use his fingers like many people do. He just is able to sort of purse his lips and, and has this 
loud, shrill whistle. Can anybody whistle here today? First service had a bunch of people. Can anybody whistle loud like that? Let me hear one. Just whistle. Good. That's, that's very much like my dad's whistle. That's a talent. I never could do it. I tried. I just can't whistle like that. I whistle like this, not the same. But my dad had a very unique whistle. It had kind of a, had a certain tone to it, probably just because we got used to it, but it had a certain kind of warbling tune to it. And he used that to call us home. We'd be playing out at one of our buddies' homes, you know, backyard football or something, a couple blocks away. And when dinner time came, my dad would just open the back door and he would whistle. And we'd stop whatever we were doing. We could hear that whistle blocks away. <laughs> shh, shh. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? Did he whistle? He whistled. He whistled. Sorry, guys, we're, we're out. We're out. We're gone. We stopped mid-play and go. Because when he whistled, we came. That's what we were taught. We listened for it. We heard it. And we followed my dad's whistle. Now, this story here today is a story about the call of God. It's about the uniqueness of the voice of God. In verse 12, we read, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. Let me talk just for a minute about, about this mysterious thing called the call of God. From cover to cover, the Bible reveals to us a personal God, a God who speaks. We've already seen that God spoke to Adam and Eve in the garden. We saw God speak to Cain, warning him of the sin that crouched at his door. Remember that? A few weeks ago? He spoke to Noah, gave him this weird command to build this giant boat because judgment was coming on all the earth. In a few weeks, we'll see he also speaks to Moses as one man speaks to another. Here he speaks to Abram, a man who later is called Abraham. But the question before us today, the question I want to deal with is, does God speak to us? Does God still speak? How do we know it when God speaks? And how does he speak to us today? Well, several things. First, God speaks to us through his word. In Hebrews we read, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. One of the uh, things that happens when you're up here and you uh, speak week after week it happens to Jeff too and Sterling as well, is that someone will come up to you regularly, it happens to me through the years, either right up here after a sermon or maybe during the week, they'll see me at a coffee shop, they'll email me, they'll say, hey, Pastor Brian, last Sunday it was like you were speaking just especially to me. It was like I was the only person in the room. Have you been following me around? You're looking in the windows of my house? How do you know that? And I always assure them I'm not a stalker. I don't do stuff like that. It's not me. This is the power of God's word. The Bible says God's word is living. It's a living thing. It's active. It penetrates. This may not be the best illustration, but it occurs to me that the Bible is kind of like God's spiritual social media. It's like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all that stuff rolled up into one. It's his way of sending us personal messages if we have ears to hear. The Bible speak, uh, God speaks through his word. Secondly, God also speaks through the Holy Spirit. In John 14, Jesus himself says, But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Now, the Holy Spirit is perhaps the most mysterious part of what we call the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The Bible teaches that when we put our faith in Christ, we not only receive the gift of salvation, the gift of eternal life, we receive the gift of called the Holy Spirit. That is, Jesus, in spiritual forms, comes to dwell in our hearts through faith. And so when we hear God's whisper through his word, or we hear, think God is speaking to us in prayer, that's the role of the Holy Spirit to speak. The Spirit's role is to convict us, to remind us, to teach us. God speaks to us through his Holy Spirit. Thirdly, God speaks through creation itself. Psalm 19 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. I was thinking about that, and I think we'd all agree that this past few months has been one of the more spectacular fall seasons in recent memory. You agree? It seemed like the colors were just especially vibrant and rich. The, tr the leaves stayed on the trees, just all, f they didn't fall down, they just stayed. We didn't, had, didn't have a big storm or rain to take them down. Just every day was more glorious than the previous day. I saw people posting pictures on social media, Facebook, over and over again. Oh, there's a tree. Oh, there's an even better tree. Oh, there's even a more beautiful tree. We had a beautiful fall season. The Bible says that's 
God's way of speaking. He speaks to us through that which he has made. He speaks to us of his own beauty and care. Fourthly, God also speaks through circumstances, through the events of our lives. C.S. Lewis once wrote, God whispers to us in our pleasures, but shouts to us in our pains. This too is a great mystery, but I believe God does use the events of our lives, good and bad, to speak to us in deeply personal ways. I've heard that many, many times from people through the years as we talk about all kinds of things happening in their lives. I think, in fact, that's what happened to us as our senior leadership team here at FBCG about a year and a half ago. Uh, our senior leadership team is made up of Pastor Jeff, myself, Pastor Bruce McAvoy, and Doug Kite, our director of operations. And about a year and a half ago, we were approached by Faith Baptist at Mill Creek for, as a, uh, about a possible merger of our churches. We weren't really looking for that sort of thing at the time, it wasn't our radar screen, but we went down and took a look at that uh, little campus down there in, in Mill Creek. And to a person, all four of us said, mm, uh, I don't think so not really interested, that we don't see how it'll work. And we walked away and said, you should go somewhere else. But over the next couple of months, we all admitted to each other, we kind of couldn't get that out of our minds. A couple of us even woke up in the middle of the night thinking about it. So we all kind of said, maybe, maybe God's up to something. Maybe he's trying to say something to us here. So we went back, and to make a long story short, we now have a third campus that will open up a little less than a year from now as God leads us on this journey called the Neighborhood Church Vision. And finally, God speaks to us most clearly through his son. Hebrews chapter 1 says, In the past God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Question, how many of you have already put up your Christmas lights? Anybody? How about your Christmas tree? How many Christmas trees are already up in your homes? Ooh, some of you still have some work to do. How many of you, have already, how, how many of you went shopping on Friday? Black Friday. Anybody? And who was everybody out there then? You guys weren't out there. But why do we do all that stuff as a culture? Why do we decorate? Why do we put up trees? Why do we shop like crazy at this time of year? Isn't it because that 2,000 years ago a child was born? 2,000 years ago a son was born. And all these decades and centuries later, we still celebrate, even if our culture is kind of forgotten. Even though we're in Genesis chapter 12, right at the beginning of the whole story, we see here a promise. And this child that we celebrate now is what this promise is all about. And we'll try to connect those dots today. So God does speak. He speaks in all kinds of ways. And speaking constantly, I believe. And in fact, he speaks so, so much that we scarcely can listen to it all. Because he always wants to speak to us. But when I managed to hear, I found that usually there's something slightly surprising, sometimes very surprising, about God's call. And I think we see this in the Bible as well. But in my own personal life, for example, at 22 years of age, when I was least expecting it, God whispered to me, I want you to spend your life in ministry. And my first reaction was, what? I, I was a psychology major. I didn't take a single course in Bible. I grew up in the church, but I didn't know how to be a pastor. I didn't want to speak in public, but he kept after it. I want you to spend your life in ministry. His call. When I was 27 and wrestling with whether or not to ask a certain young lady to be my wife, he said to me, essentially, don't be a knucklehead. What are you waiting for? And that turned out pretty well. About three years ago, I started to sense this whisper. It's time to give it away. It's time to give it away. I didn't know what it meant. And I argued for about a whole year inside myself. What do you mean? What do you mean? What do you mean? I'm, not, I'm too young. What do you mean give it away? But he made it clear. Eventually, that became our transition plan as a church family. And he's begun to bless that plan already. God's call is often surprising because he takes us out of our comfort zone to a place we've never seen before. I think some of you know what I'm talking about. For some of you, just being here today in worship at this church is way out of your comfort zone. Just a few months ago, years ago, you would say, I'll never go to a church like that. I never would. But you're here. God called you here. It's out of your comfort zone. Others of you have been serving in a thing called Buddy Break. This ministry to families with children with special needs. And when you first sensed that urge, that call, that, that, that nudge in your heart, you were like, I've never done that before. I can't do that. I can't work with kids. I, I don't know how to do that. But you did. And you're being blessed through that call. As a church family, we're being called to something we've never done before. And I, we believe God's going to bless that. Maybe God's calling you right now to do something, and you're not sure if you can do it. You're not sure. You're wrestling with him over it. 
God's call to Abraham is go. Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. And God's call then leads to the journey. We begin with the call, and secondly, we talk about the journey. My wife and I went on a journey shortly after we were married. We were married in April of 1985, and two months almost to the day, we left the country and moved to Santa Cruz, Bolivia, of all places, on a short-term mission assignment. We had no money. We had no home to go to in Bolivia. We didn't know what really we were going to do, but we said yes to going because we thought God called us to do that. turned out to be one of the best experiences we could have had for our young marriage, but it didn't start out really all that well. Uh, I had been to Bolivia the year before on a touring basketball team, so I'd seen the culture, the language, familiar with the language, and, and the poverty. Bolivia was the second poorest country in the Western Hemisphere at that time, right behind Haiti. Maybe it still is, I'm not sure. But my new bride had never been to that part of the world. She grew up in Malaysia and Singapore and, uh, and that part of the world, but never been to a place quite like Bolivia. So I'd spent the months prior to our going convincing her how awesome it was going to be. It's going to be fun. It's going to be interesting. The people are wonderful. We're going to have all this cool stuff to do and see. And then we got there, and she discovered it wasn't quite like I had described it to her. And by the end of the very first day in Santa Cruz, Bolivia, I was sitting with my wife on the side of a road on a curb, and she was throwing up into the street. Because the, sound, the smells and the travel just overwhelmed her. So here it was, she had trusted me, she had trusted the call, we'd gone there to spend this time together, and she was getting sick right in the street. See, sometimes the journey is difficult. God calls Abraham to make a journey to a place he'd never been. See, Abraham grew up, the Bible tells us, in a place called Ur, which was in modern-day Iraq, way over by the Euphrates River and the Persian Gulf. Uh, The first leg of their journey had been from Ur, all the way to Haran, up in modern-day Syria, a journey of about 500 miles. They seem to have settled in Haran for some time, enough for the whole clan to get comfortable, and then God calls Abram to get up and leave all that and go another 600 miles uh, westward through the Jordan Valley all the way to the land of Canaan. It's about 1,100 miles on foot in total, and remember, Abraham is 75 years old. I'm thinking if I'm Abram at that time, I would want to argue a bit with God about this call. Maybe something like, really? Now? I mean, I'm retired. I have a nice place in Haran. We're comfortable here. You want me to go there? Let me live in a tent the rest of my life? Uh, I don't think so. You got the wrong guy. But the Bible says simply, verse 4, so Abram went. Those are three powerful words. So Abram went went. As the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him, Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran, and Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired as their servants, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. The sense here in the story as you read it is that when God called Abram, Abram knew that it was a one-way call. He knew it was permanent. They packed up everything they had because there was no return ticket. See, faith is a journey. Faith is a journey. Sometimes the journey is long. Sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes you can't quite see the destination, but it's a journey of trust. In Hebrews chapter 11 in the New Testament, we read, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive his inheritance, as he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he went to live in the land of a promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. Here's something else I noticed. When God calls us to something, he quite often calls us to leave something. Does that make sense? When he calls us to something, he calls us to leave something. Jesus called Peter, Andrew, and John, and James to become fishers of men. He said, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. And they did to change the world, but they left behind their boats and their nets forever. Jesus called Saul of Tarsus to become Paul the Apostle, to preach the gospel to the known world, but he left behind his old life as Saul of Tarsus. And God still calls. He calls us. He calls you. A couple of questions to think about. Do you know what he's called you to? Do you have a sense of what he's asking you to leave behind? I mentioned as a church family, we believe God's calling us to a journey, a journey to love and serve our neighbors. 
to a place we've not been before, our third campus down at Mill Creek in Batavia. It's a journey outside our comfort zone. It's a journey we've not been on before. But just like with Abram, it's a journey that comes with a promise. And that's the third part of what we look at today, the promise. There's the call, a journey, and then the promise. Verse 2, And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. See, in the process of calling Abram to this long and difficult journey, God also makes what is an astonishing promise. And we get so used to this story. Maybe you're reading through it in your book club. We're used to the story. We can kind of miss how surprising this is. Why so surprising? Because at this point, from all we can tell, Abram is just kind of an ordinary guy. He's kind of an ordinary old guy. The Bible makes a point. He's 75 years old. And he has no children. He and his wife are childless. And in that culture at that time, to be childless, to be without a son, meant to be a, be a great failure. Meant he had no heirs to carry on his family name whatsoever. Abram was anything but great. And here comes the promise. I will make your name great. I will make you the father of a great nation. In fact, the one who comes from you, through that child, I will bless the entire world. Every family on the face of the earth. It's astonishing. I was thinking about what that means and what that might have meant to Abram. And I thought about my own uh, mother. My mom is 86 years old, struggling with the beginnings of Alzheimer's or some dementia. She grew up in the hills of eastern Kentucky. This is her at age six. It's kind of pixelated, but she's standing in front of her grandfather's log cabin. She grew up among mountain people in Pike County. Pure and simple mountain people. I'm talking no indoor plumbing, chickens in your backyard, wringing their necks before dinner to pluck your own chickens. I mean, that's how she grew up. Uh, uh, stills in the backyard in the woods, making moonshine, that kind of stuff. Uh, most of the people that she grew up with never finished high school. Many never went to school. We're talking about dirt floor cabins, that kind of stuff, in the, in the early 1920s and 30s. She was not raised in a Christian home, but she became a follower of Jesus when she was 19 years old when she attended a little missionary meeting in a dirt floor chapel uh, just outside of her little town. Uh, then when, a few years later, at age 24, she quit her job. She was working at a tobacco company. She announced to her parents she was going to quit her job and go to college. She tells this story quite often these days, and her own mother cried when she told her because she thought she was throwing her life away by going to college. Because in those days, women never went to college. There wasn't a single woman in my mother's entire extended family ever went to college except her. But she just felt like God was calling her to do something greater, to something bigger. So she saved up all her money. She had enough for one semester. She left her little town, went to a place she'd never seen before, never been before, never even seen a picture before. That was Taylor University in Indiana that she had heard about, the only Christian college she'd ever heard of. And she went, sight unseen, thinking she could stay for at least one semester. Well, she tells the story, within a year or so, she had a job working for the president of the university, met a young fella who pursued her, they got married, and then they had a baby on their very first wedding anniversary. And that was me. Another son followed, another one after that. And to make a long story short, she and my father ended up serving some 10 churches over 60 years. My brother and I have now been pastors for another combined 50 years. We can't even begin to count the number of people, men, women, students who've responded to God's call through the churches that we've been blessed enough to serve. But the point is this. It all began 65 years ago when God called a single 24-year-old mountain girl who had rarely even traveled outside the county she was born in to go to a place she'd never been to before, to go all in. If God had told her on that day, I will make you great, my mother would have argued. She would have said, I don't have anything. I don't know anything. I don't even have a husband, let alone children. If God had said, I will bless many others through you, my mother would have said, I don't even know how you can bless me, let alone anybody else. But that's how God works. That's how the promise works. That's what the gospel does. And I've seen this story dozens and dozens of times in people I've talked to through the years. It's happening right now in dozens and dozens of families right here as you sit here. And for some of you, you can't see it, but it's beginning to happen, and it's going to happen. See, when you hear God's call, when you hear God's voice, when you put your faith in Christ, you decide to follow Him, He not only gives you a new heart, new identity, a new purpose, and a new destiny, he also 
will turn your family tree upside down. He also will bless entire generations of your family through your decision. That's just how the gospel works. So, where are we in the great story? It's called the story of God. We've seen creation, and that whole story. We've seen sin come into the world. We've seen the curse. We've seen God's judgment through the flood. We've seen the beginnings of his promise. As he promises to make a way of salvation. But now that promise begins to take shape, and it takes the shape of a son. It's a strange promise that comes in a strange way to a 75-year-old man and his wife who are childless. He promises they will become the parents, the fathers of a great nation. They will have heirs, and they don't have any yet. So it's the promise of a son that will bless the whole world. So what's God up to? Where's the whole story going? Well, I think we know. We heard it already earlier this morning. Centuries later, long after Abraham is gone, God would speak again. He would speak to a young woman named Mary. He would take her on a journey she couldn't begin to imagine. He said, you will conceive and give birth to a son. And he spoke to a righteous man named Joseph who couldn't begin to imagine the journey he was going to go on. He spoke to him about her, his bride-to-be, saying, she will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And that's the son that's foreshadowed in the promise to Abraham. You see the connection? That's the son that's promised to us today. That's why we celebrate this time of the year. The final question is, where are you in your story? We all have a story. We're all living out a story. Where are you in your story? Have you heard the voice of God speaking to your heart? Have you opened your heart to him in faith, responded to his call? Maybe he's calling you to serve in some way you haven't served yet. Maybe something inside you says, oh, I've never done that before. I don't know if I can do that, but he's calling. Are you ready to follow? Or maybe you've long since decided to follow. You've opened your heart to him and you're following the best you can, but that road seems long. Parts of the journey are hard. You didn't expect to hit this snag or that snag. You didn't expect to be lonely. You look at your own family tree and you're not sure what's happening. You're tempted to despair. Well, this story of Abraham tells us, keep walking. Keep walking. The journey's long. Keep walking. The promise is good. The promise is for you. A son has been born. A Savior has come. A Savior who knows you by name and speaks to you, who calls you to follow him, who leads you to places you've never been before, who's able to bless you and through you to bless others in ways you can't begin to imagine. So keep walking. Keep trusting. Because the promise is for you. You bow with me as I close today. Lord, we thank you today for your word. We thank you that for your, this ancient man named Abram, Abraham, who heard your call and trusted and followed when it didn't seem to make any sense, who just kept walking. Thank you for the promise of a son, your son, through whom the whole world is blessed. In your name that we pray. Amen. Just before the benediction, I want to remind you or thank you in advance for helping us stack the chairs before you leave. And as you leave, stop by the Together at Christmas kiosk, pick up your materials there, and even use the photo booth if you'd like. We'd love to see those photos posted under the hashtag at FBCG Together. Benediction comes from Ephesians chapter 3. May we go now in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the promise of God and who can do more than, measurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work in us. Amen. Have a great day. Joy to the world, the Lord is come.